We're here in downtown Columbia, Tennessee at the epicenter of the events of the Columbia Race Riot of 1946. And we're here with two local pastors, Russ Adcox and Trent Ogilvie, uh, two of the founders of the Stand Together Fellowship, uh, to talk about what happened that night, why it's important for us to still be learning about and talking about this event, and what they've been doing to foster these conversations in the community. Um, so Russ, do you want to take us through what happened on the night of February 25th and into the 26th in 1946? Yeah, so this was a, an event that was local, as you said, but it had national, national ramifications. It, the, the ripples of this event spread throughout our nation, and I ultimately think it was a precursor to the civil rights movement that, that officially is recognized as starting nine years later with the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955. But uh, this event was one of the first, if not the first event of resistance on the part of African Americans post-World War II. And of course, James Stevenson and Billy Fleming was where it started. James was just returning from uh, his service in the army and he had gone with his mother, Gladys, to the Castronaut store to pick up a radio that she was having repaired. And there was a... And that was just right up on the public square in that corner near where Puckett's is now, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, right there. And um, there was a dispute over the radio. And so Gladys and uh, Billy Fleming, who was the radio repair person, had gotten into a dispute over that. And as they were walking out the door, she ultimately took the radio home and wasn't going to get it repaired. As so walking out the door, she had made some comments about, you know, don't bring your radio to get repaired here. And uh, James had kind of got into it with Billy a little bit. And so as James turned around and was leaving, Billy followed him out and punched him in the back of the head. And James turned around, unbeknownst to Billy at the time, well, James was a welterweight boxer in the service. And so he and Billy started fighting. And actually James, pu uh, James punched Billy through the plate glass window at Castronaut. So the fight spilled out into the square. Well, of course, there's people on the square milling about and they see a white man, a black man fighting. And so they come and begin attacking James, and they also begin attacking Gladys. And Billy is bleeding at this time because he went through the plate glass window. Well, ultimately the sheriff comes, and uh, Gladys and James are both arrested for fighting and taken to the, to the jail. Now, they're about to be released later that day because it's a minor offense, but Billy's father comes, I believe it's Flo Fleming, if I get the, there's several Flemings in the yeah, story, Flo so. Is the brother. Blow the flows of brothers. Okay, so anyway, there's a John Fleming is the father. He comes and uh, wants to charge James with attempted murder, and so Sheriff Underwood has no choice but to keep him. There's a charge now pending of attempted murder. Well, meanwhile, there are some groups of white citizens that start milling about the square, and there's talk of we're going to get James for what he's done. We're going. There's talk of lynchings. Uh, there's rumor of a of rope being bought at the uh, Porter Walker store, which is uh, right there where Puckett's is now. So all of these rumors are going on, and so Sheriff Underwood decides to release James to the care of Julius Blair and uh, James Morton. And James Morton, they're both leaders in the African-American community, and we're standing in the historic African-American business district. Yeah, the, the barbershop is right here, the, where the white building okay. is. That was right, yeah. right. And this was a very bustling business district, a lot of activity and, and very prosperous. And uh, so these two leaders, they take James, get him back here, and then ultimately get him out of the area to Chicago. So there's a whole story about how they got him out of the area to Chicago, but they ultimately ferried him out of the area. And uh, meanwhile, night falls, and there are groups of white citizen, a mob, if you will, that's gathered at the square, and they're talking of lynching. And those rumors are getting back down into this district, and what is known of the African American community at the time, there's two events in mind. One is a lynching in 1933, which was just 13 years earlier, of Cordy Cheek in the Glendale community. And then the other is a lynching in 1927 of Henry Shote, and his body was actually hung from the west portico of the courthouse and hung for a couple of days facing that way. Of course, the jails uh, at that time is at the courthouse. So there's, there's all of this talk, and uh, Saul Blair, I believe it is, said there will be no more social lynchings in this county or in this community. And so all the lights get shot out 
down here. So, and, and citizens have armed themselves, and there's a lot of servicemen that have returned from World War II. They get on the rooftops with weapons. All the lights get shot out. They hear the shots up at the square. And so four policemen come down to investigate. So they come down this hill and come down East 8th Street, walking into what was known as Mink Slide or the bottom at the time. Mm -hmm. They come walking down here in the dark. Uh, they're told to stop, and they don't. And so they're fired upon. All four of those officers are hit. None of them uh, suffer any serious wounds. But that's when Sheriff Underwood calls the governor and asks him to activate the state guard. And so the next morning, this is all on February 25th, mm -hmm. that evening. The next morning on the 26th, the state guard arrives and the Tennessee Highway Patrol arrives. And uh, remind me, Tennessee Highway Patrol, I, I've lost his name. Uh, Lynn Bomer. Lynn Bomer, yeah. Um, the Highway Patrol is supposed to wait on the State Guard to come into the area the next morning. So Lynn Bomer and the Highway Patrol do not wait on the State Guard. There's, I think there's 600-something troops with the State Guard. They do not wait. The Highway Patrol comes in and they ransack uh, the black community. They destroy Morton Funeral Home. There's a famous picture of that with KKK mm -hmm. painted on a casket. Uh, they destroy uh, Julius Blair's barber shop. They arrest over a hundred African Americans. They beat uh, some of the African Americans. There's a there's a picture that you can see of a famous picture where an African American man is beaten nearly to death. It's lying in the street here on East State Street, and so all of that happens on the 26th, and all of that gets characterized as a race riot, and uh, the newspaper coverage obviously is very biased at the time. None of that was ever investigated, so there's no uh, the the Highway Patrol was never found held accountable for any of their actions. None of their actions were ever investigated. And um, the, the coverage thereafter was that it was a race riot, but it, the rioting really took place on the part of the Highway Patrol. Yeah. Uh, it was really Lynn Bomer that was in his reckless attitude that um, created the riot. And that's where the destruction came in as well. But uh, of the hundred that were arrested, uh, I believe it was Miss Morton ended up calling the NAACP and they sent uh, Z. Alexander Luby and Maurice Weaver down here to defend uh, those who had been arrested. And they ended up getting about 70 of them out. So they filed a, a writ of habeas corpus and got 70 of them released. There were 26 that were charged and they were charged with attempted murder. I don't know what happened with the charge with Gladys and James, but they were never charged um, uh, formally. But there were 26 that were charged. One of them died in prison or died in jail awaiting trial and then 25 were ultimately tried in Lawrence County. And uh, of those 25, only two were acquitted. And I think only one served about four months time before they were pardoned by the governor of state. 23 were acquitted and then, yeah, yeah, 23 were acquitted, I'm sorry. And two were, <clears throat> two were uh, actually charged, yeah. Uh, and so we are right here, kind of in the middle of where all this happened. We're kind of in the middle of that first block on East 8th Street. We've got Main Street up here and then Woodland Street down here. And like you were saying, there's this mob forming up around the courthouse square, yeah. so just a block away. Um, so kind of between this street right here and then up along uh, Main Street up to the public square is where all of this kind yeah. of back and forth is happening all it's, night long. You really can't see probably with the camera, but we're, we're in the shadow of the courthouse. You can see the spire of the courthouse. And so it, we're almost close enough to hear voices. Yeah. And so you could almost hear the voices being shouted back and forth. and. You can see how the rumors and the things that got started that led to the event. Mm -hmm. To me, I think there's a couple of things that are really interesting about this. Um, you know, first of all, when I think about what I learned about history in school, uh, you know, and how a lot of us often think about history is you think about kind of the big events or the big movements. You know, you think about World War II and you think about the Civil Rights Movement. But what's happening here in Columbia is really kind of a, it's a connection between the two because you have all of these african-american veterans who had just gotten done um, fighting for this idea of freedom in europe uh, and they come home and they're being subject to the same treatment as before they left uh, and that's not acceptable and they're starting to figure out ways to work together and you know say we're not going to accept mm -hmm. that treatment um, and you see that in a lot of the pictures with, you know, there's a lot of veterans involved in what happens here that night. And mm -hmm. I think you mentioned that. Um, so this is really a, it's a connecting point between World War II, 
and then the civil rights movement yeah. as we think of it in the 50s and 60s. And, and some of the national attention, not only in NAACP was involved in this, but uh, Thurgood Marshall was one of the lawyers. He didn't actually get to represent the defendants in the Lawrence County trial because he was sick, but uh, he was here in Murray County. And there's a famous story about that if we have time. But uh, Eleanor Roosevelt and uh, Channing Tobias formed the National Committee of Justice, and that was in response to what happened in mm -hmm. Columbia, and they distributed, I, I read recently, over 50,000 uh, pamphlets. And uh, the district, or the, not the district attorney, the Attorney General of the United States actually formed a uh, federal grand jury investigation into what happened mm -hmm. here. There were ultimately no charges that came out of it, but it was an, it was an incident that was getting national attention. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's also why it's important when you look at history of why it was labeled a riot, because at that time there were other riots that took place, but this was really a resistance or what I, I term a rising of black citizens saying, we're not going to let the history of, of mistreatment, you know, inhumane, um, un, um, unjustified, but also really un, undisciplined violence against the black community continued. Um, and it was about dignity and respect at that moment to say no more. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're going to be respected for who we are. Um, we know that the law may say one thing, but as far as our rights and who we are, we're going to be, we're going to stand up for our country. But really it's almost like saying before I can really stand up for my country, I got to stand up for myself. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, making that stand for, uh, themselves, their humanity, and their community was very important. Um, and um, I think that narrative kind of gets lost when you look at the word riot because the way it's termed, the way history is taught, and even the way we look at movements of today in regards to social justice. Anytime there's a riot and it involves African Americans, it's like, oh, well, they're burning buildings, they're breaking windows, and they're starting fires and damaging. And when you look at the story and you really know the history of what happened here, February 25th and 26th of 1946, it's the exact opposite. But we don't really tell that story. We let yeah. it kind of get sensationalized. Yeah. And unfortunately, um, that history that we don't recognize and that we don't in properly interpret winds up getting repeated. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Which I think speaks to why you two are involved in leading some of these conversations about, I mean, this incident, but not just this incident, more than that, much more than that. Uh, so do you want to tell me a little bit about your organization, Stand Together Fellowship, how that started and uh, what you've done, what you've got planned for the future? Yes, yeah, so Stand Together Fellowship, we were formed in 2015 after the uh, shooting at Mother Emanuel AME Church um, in um, South Carolina. And uh, really, an uh, outcry as to what happened there in, in, in Charleston, South Carolina, and basically being able to recognize that um, evil, yes, it does exist, but uh, evil, no matter what kind of evil, where it is present, it cannot overcome good and it can't overcome love. And so it's one thing for a community here in Columbia looking at that to say, we're going to come together, we're going to have a a uh, unity service at St. Paul AME Church and uh, ministers and pastors, everybody wants to come and pray and say, you know, how shocked and so sorry that that has happened. But we also got to remember that Columbia has its own history, ha has its own past. And we have the same elements of uh, white supremacy and, and, you know, injustice that exists that you know could happen here as well so stand together was really birthed out of that is saying let this not be a one-time event uh, in response to a national tragedy but let's come together come to the table to listen to learn to be able to communicate about these real issues about our history that in in, um, in my belief it has been unresolved i've, I've lived here all my life and um, unfortunately there are really two histories there's a history that is handed down and repeated in the black community, and then that's one that is, mm -hmm. you know, repeated in the uh, white community. But if we're all in Mary County, we're all citizens, we need to understand the history, be able to deal with it, no matter how difficult right. it is, because if we don't do that, it shapes and affects 
what's happening in our community today. And I don't believe we're being true to who we are and what we can really become. And yeah. so Stand Together um, saw that and, and wanted to have a, a regular meeting, you know, once a month, uh, first Friday. We can sit down at the table with elected officials, community leaders, pastors, um, and talk about these topics. Uh, local police department, that's where we're holding the meeting. So ironically, mm. when we talk about relationships with law enforcement and how law enforcement may be perceived in the black community, if you don't understand the history of 1946 and what was taught, told, and you know, relayed in the black community, then that's why some tensions exist today. The Columbia should embrace this story because I think it's a heroic story. It's a resistance or a rising up, and it was, it was among the African Americans to say, we don't want to be treated this way anymore. It's not just the lynching, but they're also rising up at this time of Jim Crow segregation. Uh, and it ultimately led to changes, I think, in Columbia. There's things that we still need to work on, but there were also changes that took place. And I think, you know, Julius Blair, Saul Blair, James Morton, these, these people should be recognized mm -hmm. as, as local heroes because they were local civil rights heroes. And uh, there, was, there was no, lo no lynchings after that. Mm -hmm. You know, that, was, that stand changed things. Of course, things were changing, of course, the, the, the course of the country as well. But uh, it was a significant event that happened here, and, and Columbia needs to embrace that story. Talk about the lynchings, and talk about what actually took took place. It was to send a clear message, you know, you, you know, you don't have respect, you don't have the dignity, um, you got to stay in your place, or else, mm -hmm. you know, that that whole narrative. And so, for them to stand up and for what took place, you know, with in regard to their businesses, this personal sacrifice that they made. On, on the night in, in uh, February uh, the 25th of 1946, there was a meeting. So you got a group uptown meeting talking about lynching someone. You got a group here that's assembled to protect their community. Uh, but there was another group meeting talking about how they can raise money for the school, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, to, to build a school um, here and, and making sure that they had the money uh, to, uh, uh, build, um, I think it was uh, Carver or Smith um, at, at the time, and that's going on while all these dynamics are happening. So you got to think about the people who, you know, are part of that story, are just trying to have a better community mm -hmm. to say I, we don't want to go in with Columbia as our home, but you know we're not going to be disrespected. We're not going to allow this to continue, and I think with all in me that the reason that was so important and they're having a meeting about children education is to say, if we don't make this stand now, what's gonna to happen to our children? What's gonna to happen to the generation coming behind us? Mm -hmm. What kind of place is Columbia gonna be for them? Hey everybody, thanks for joining us today. I really appreciate uh, pastors Russ Adcox and Trent Ogilvie from the Stand Together Fellowship taking their time to talk with us about the events of February 25th and 26th, 1946, uh, what we often refer to as the Columbia Race Riot, although that might not be uh, the best way to refer to it. I'd be interested to hear what you think about that. Uh, but I think there's so many things that we can learn from this incident. Uh, first of all, we see the power of community history. Uh, when people in the black community heard that rumor that there could potentially be a lynching, uh, that wasn't an abstract thing to them. That was a very real threat because Murray County had a history of lynchings. Um, so you can understand why people were very concerned about protecting their community um, and were very quick to react to that. Um, we also see how things like this happening in communities all over the country had a direct impact on um, early civil rights legislation. Uh, Columbia was the first major post-World War II racial conflict, but it certainly was not the only one. Uh, so there are people in these communities all over the country having these same concerns, these same um, confrontations, and you can see that this is starting to get the attention of people in very high places. Um, like we mentioned, you have former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt uh, taking an interest in what happened here in Columbia. Uh, 
even the Attorney General, the President of the United States are starting to have these conversations that, you know, these things can't continue, this um, violence and these threats against African Americans. Uh, on the historic marker, you see it mentions the President's oh. Committee on Civil Rights. And out of that, there are uh, really significant executive orders uh, addressing things like desegregation in the federal workforce and in the armed forces. Uh, so even though when we think about the civil rights movement, we often think about the 1950s and 1960s, uh, we're really seeing the seeds of that here in 1946 in Colombia and across the country. Uh, I hope that this conversation has helped you understand a little bit better what happened uh, that evening and why it's so important, not only for our community, but also for our country to um, understand and to talk about, um, you know, even 75 years later. Um, so I hope that's been helpful to you. I know that that conversation really gave me a lot to think about. Um, I hope you'll join us next month for our, our next episode. And again, if you wanna support this effort, um, I hope you will go ahead and subscribe to our videos, either on YouTube or Facebook. Um, like them, share them, and if you really want to support, go ahead and uh, click that Patreon button and consider becoming a subscriber. Thanks.